So why is negative critique considered more honest than being kind? First, let me say I'm Daniel Whittington. I'm the Chancellor at Wizard Academy and Whiskey Marketing School. And this bottle is thanks to Mike Russo, who dropped it off during class. And I was like, oh, I'll talk about that one, because that one is uh, it's Willet. Everybody knows Willet. And then I went to do the research on it and realized he gave me like a three to $500 bottle of whiskey here. And so thanks, Mike Russo. Uh, I had no idea. But evidently on the interwebs, the purple top Willet, it's a thing. So we're going to talk about it today. But first, I keep seeing this idea across the interwebs. And it's not a new idea because the same thing existed in literary criticism and when I was a musician. I mean, I'm still a musician, but when I was a professional musician in the industry, uh, album critics and Rolling Stone. It was always this idea that when someone said good things, that's fine. But when they blasted something, they were being honest. And I think that that is not true. <laughs> uh, can, are there circumstances where being offering a critique is more truthful? Yeah, absolutely. But does that mean that somehow saying nice things about something you love is inherently less honest? No, definitely not. So, but I get why we value it. So first I'm gonna try to offer a defense of the idea of negative criticism. When I was first started writing songs, I was 15, 16, I got my guitar for the first time, stuck with it, wrote my first song, showed it to my parents, my mom said, oh, Daniel, that's, that's great. Well done. And my dad said, yeah, that's all right. It was pretty decent for a first verse and chorus for the first time of writing a song. It feels like you phoned in the rest of it, though. <laughs> so you might need to work on that. And my mom said, oh, Brad, what? Just tell him he did a great job. This is his first song he's ever written. And my dad said... Some version, this is not a word-for-word -word conversation recall, some version of what good does that do him? <laughs> he is learning to write songs. He's showing that he has a natural talent for it. I think he's capable of more than he just put down here. So how is me saying, good job, well done, son, going to help him be a better songwriter? And he was right. Um, but also, mom was right. I did need somebody to just be like, well done, you're doing a good thing worth doing. I also needed somebody to go, hey, you're capable of more. So luckily I had both. <laughs> but I will tell you, in defense of criticism, what it's led to is in that category, I trust my dad's response to a song that I've written and his response in positive or negative a little bit more than I trust my mom's. And I don't mean that I don't think she has a valid opinion. I just think I know that my mom loves me and I know that she supports me. And uh, she has been honest. There's been times where she sat and was like, mm, I don't really like this song. And I have to go, well, I do. <laughs> um, but I know why she says that. Whereas when my dad speaks up and said something, I sort of trust that he's speaking to the merits of the thing versus necessarily his preference for a song. And so he might be going like, mm, I think I heard some weak spots here and you might push here. Or he might just go, man, that is a damn good song. And then I go, holy crap. And you know what? It feels more powerful um, in that moment to get a, I've got nothing to say, well done. And we know this to be true as human beings. If someone says, I love you a hundred times a day, you believe them. But if someone says it once a year and then they mean it that once a year, that might suck for raising a child or being in a relationship. But son of a bitch, if that one time a year, you're not like, damn, that's weighty, right? Now, I don't, I think that's a, a frustrating reality in the human psychology, but it is a reality. And so I think that plays into the idea that when someone offers a critique, if it's thoughtful and not cruel, sometimes that feels more real than, hey, this is a great whiskey. I like it. I think you'll like it. And it even feels maybe more real than, here's why I like it. But first, let's talk about this. This is uh, their own whiskey. This is summer 2022, I think was the first time released. I don't know what, which 
release this is because it doesn't tell us, but it is eight years old and 54%. Good night. So they distilled in spring of 2013. They started distilling, bottled in 2022. Char 4 American Oak, which is not as common. A much heavier char than 30. Uh, closer to what would you call alligator char. And it's corn, wheat, and barley, supposedly. Okay, so I'm, I'm pausing because the nose is really dense. And I'm trying to find what's behind it. But immediately, I get sort of a, a roasted pastry, dark cherry, heavy, bitter, dark chocolate. And I'm getting a lot of barrel, um, barrel notes to the point where it almost smells smoky, even though that's not, it's not smoky, but something my brain is interpreting as smoky. And I think it's just the barrel is rich in this. All right. Okay, so that's really simple. Really simple. It's not bad, but with the way the nose was so dense, I feel like I was expecting a lot more to happen in the palate, and it didn't. It just sort of went thump, <laughs> like wham, here you go. I'm only getting one thing, and it's that same exact thing I smelled, which is nice to have that consistency, but it's that sort of charred chocolate cherry and then grain. And that's it. And then it goes away. Lingers with a little bit of charred sugar, like burnt brown sugar. But there's not much to this. I, I'm not going to argue boring, but it is very simple. This reminds me... Oh, man. I'm going to say something... Man, I can't believe I'm doing exactly what I'm talking about in this video. <laughs> oh, talk about meta. This reminds me of when I've built blends and I'm building the complexity and at some point it just goes thump and falls and becomes this monolithic single thing instead of all of the depth and breadth and nuance. And sometimes that single monolithic thing tastes really good, but it's also a single monolithic thing. And... This tastes like that. It tastes like the mix of barrels they put into it just sort of went ah, and condensed like a like a, a a giant magnet sucking everything across the room into itself. And I want more. I want more than that, uh, especially for three hundred dollars a bottle. Like I get why you would price things that way. It's not for me. And for $300 in American whiskey, you can get some truly magnificent stuff. But to release the first thing they ever made all the way and blended and all that kind of stuff, I get why it would be priced high. It's closer to craft, rare craft releases. Okay, so. Unsolicited advice is the junk mail of life. <laughs> and so often, on YouTube channels and blogs and the internet or a whiskey review website, you are put in the position of offering unsolicited advice to a whiskey maker that you chose to go buy and review and then critique them. And uh, so in that vein, I think that's fair because uh, lots of people want to know what things taste like. And anytime I'm going to buy something, I go online and look the stuff up. And I have trusted people that, like, I trust their review of a motorcycle more than I trust this person's review of a motorcycle. And so when I hear other people review it, I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But when this person talks about it, I listen. And I get that. That sort of uh, same thing goes with album reviews and Rolling Stone. I used to be able to find, like, my trusted album reviewer. And I was like, oh, when that guy likes an album, I know I'm going to love that album. Um, and so there's room for that third-party critique, the gateway between consumer and producer. That's fine. But I think it's important to approach it knowing that you are offering unsolicited advice and that you might be critiquing them on merits that they weren't using to measure themselves. 
so many brands have a measuring stick and this is what they're grading themselves on. And then you come to it, grading them on a whole other scale and they don't meet up, they don't measure. And you go, ah, oh, they failed. And they go, failed at what? We don't, weren't even trying to do that. <laughs> and so I think it's important as someone talking about whiskey to acknowledge what it is they were trying to accomplish and did they measure up to their own measuring stick as far as you can guess. And then to be honest with what you think about things, because if you're always bullshitting people and telling them everything's amazing, yes, I get why that doesn't matter. But simply being negative doesn't equal honest. Let me say that honest opinions can sometimes be negative, but not all negative opinions are immediately honest. <laughs> so, Willett is a big brand, not as big as, you know, Buffalo Trace or things like that, sure, or Jim Beam, but they're a big, bigger than Kraft. And if I was guessing, I would say they were going for a high age statement, greatest level of crowd approval, easier to drink for the masses, kind of like the general public would appreciate the richness of this thing. And in that category, rolling in with a one monolithic, wham, powerful note, probably very effective for that crew. And yeah, with a little bit of water, it just gets a little bit sweeter and tannic at the same time, but it loses its complexity that it had in the first place. I think 114 is right where it should have been. If they were going for that sort of crowd approval, then they nailed it. As somebody who wants to find all of that nuance and complexity, I'm not getting it and that disappoints me, but I might be measuring them against the wrong stick. <laughs> so be careful, hold your opinions loosely, be honest when it's good and when it's bad, but always be kind. I'm really glad you're here. Cheers. Cheers.